here comes the fourth and last question. And again, it's an amalgamation of questions um, pulled together by our mentors. Um, and here is what they've written. <clears throat> In general, you are speaking of the healthy adult matured mind brain. Have you explored the developing mind, that is, infant through teens? I, wanted to, I want to better understand how to help these young minds better self-regulate. We know that babies who are physically well looked after, fed, clothed, etc., but emotionally severely neglected, as some institutionalized babies are, do not thrive bodily as well as mentally. They grow apathetic and uninterested in the environment. Not very different from your example of people with encephalitis lethargica. Can we say that a defining property of the mind is that it must have other minds to be a mind? So, uh, first of all, uh, the, it's, it's probably correct that I tend, my default mode is to, is to talk about the mind in its fully mature form. Um, but I must emphasize that the instinctual mechanisms uh, that I've spoken of are present from birth. Um, it's, the, it's this learning from experience as to how to meet your, how to marry your instincts with the external world, how to meet your needs in the external world. It's, that's the developmental process. So the developmental process has mainly to do with corticothalamic mechanisms, which, which sort of um, mediate between these instincts which are there from birth and the outside world. And it really is simply a matter. Uh, it can be put as simply as, it being a matter of learning from experience. That's what the developmental process is all about. And um, certainly there are things that we know um, about critical periods. Uh, I've already spoken in one of the questions uh, for this week about Conrad Lorenz's experiment about printing, I mean, Im uh, imprinting by, by uh, the little geese, uh, the attachments that happen at certain periods um, in the developmental sequence. And that then can't be undone. Uh, in our case, in the first six months of life, this happens, us humans, and then we make those uh, early attachment bonds as absolutely critical, uh, can't be done later, and things that go wrong with that process at that stage you know, are going to have lifelong consequences, like the, um, in the case of the institutionalized babies, the René Spitz work that's being referred to in this question. Um, so what I'm saying is that, yes, uh, it's very important uh, to think developmentally. Um, we have to think developmentally. Um, the, 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 there are things that happen at certain stages in the maturational process that can't happen at any other point. And once they've happened, you know, they have, they have lifelong consequences. And it's not only the early years. There are also uh, there are momentous changes that occur during puberty and during adolescence. And uh, there's been a lot of work um, uh, over the last uh, decades on the adolescent brain. Um, I don't know how many people know that our prefrontal lobes, which is our crowning evolutionary you know, glory as humans, uh, this is our evolutionary pride and joy that we've got these big fat prefrontal lobes, uh, that what they do is more than any other part of the brain is inhibit modulate and regulate these, these instinctual emotional forces. That part of the brain only reaches full physical maturity in your late 20s. You know, in your late 20s. So, uh, biologically speaking, you know, you, you're sort of an adolescent until, you know, pretty much uh, and, until the end of the third decade of your life. And uh, this, uh, the, the relative immaturity of the prefrontal lobes uh, in the years preceding your late 20s has everything to do with the way that teenagers behave. Um, and again, as I said, there is good research on exactly this. Uh, there's, there's no question about it that uh, the, the, the relative imbalance between the uh, instinctual, that is to say, emotional uh, limbic brain with all of its hormonal um, influences, that when you have the hormonal surges of puberty, uh, regulated by a relatively inefficient and ineffective prefrontal cortex, then you're going to have the, the exactly the sort of things that we see, um, you know, in, in 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 teenage behavior, and we are, you know, getting. There's also very interesting research on sleep, that, you know, our kids, 
you know, of that age, they don't want to wake up early in the morning and they want to go to sleep late at night. And there really is a difference in the circadian, uh, in the, in the sleep-waking cycle um, of uh, our brains at that age than once you reach my age. They really are not properly awake early in the morning, those, those poor teenagers who then have to get shoved off to school when they're literally, <laughs> physically, cognitively incapable you know, of, of managing. So um, all of this, uh, just to say, yes, indeed, a developmental perspective is terribly important and that um, we do have interesting new knowledge emerging all the time from a neuroscientific point of view uh, to supplement uh, what we'd learned in previous decades purely psychologically um, and, and so on. But I want, to, I want to particularly focus on these last two uh, comments made in the question. The one about the um, institutionalized babies uh, being apathetic and uninterested in the environment and saying that they're not that different from uh, people with encephalitis lethargica. Um, the, the, uh, what we're seeing there is a form of depression. It's called anaclytic depression, or it used to be called anaclytic depression. You know, the, the, these institutionalized babies do indeed have down-regulated seeking systems, uh, the, the system that motivates you, that interests you in the world, that makes you expect good things are going to happen. Uh, this system is down-regulated. This dopamine system is down-regulated um, in those kids. And um, the, the uh, uh, encephalitis lethargica epidemic attacked exactly that same system, except it attacked it physically. It wasn't a matter of, of, of functional regulation, but actual tissue damage to that system. So although it's a much more extreme version, um, what the questioner um, is asking or, or observing is, is a correct uh, observation, that uh, the, the, the despair, the, the depression um, of the, in those institutionalized uh, kids um, is mediated by the same system as is attacked or was attacked in the encephalitis lethargica epidemic. Um, then the, the last thing I wanted to say was about this uh, question right at the end. Can we say that a defining property of the mind is that it must have other minds to be a mind? And you can see where that comment comes from in relation to all the other um, aspects of this question. Uh, the, the, implicit in the question is, is saying there's no such thing as a baby. Uh, to, to quote a, a famous English psychoanalyst, Donald Winnicott, he said, there's no such thing as a baby, meaning the, 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 a baby can't thrive without a caregiver, that they are a unit. Uh, the, the one uh, just doesn't make sense without the other, literally can't exist without the other. And so if you want to understand the baby, you have to look at the relationship between mother and baby. And if you want to understand the mind of the baby, the personality of the child that emanates from that baby, then you need to understand it in relation to the other mind or minds that, that cared for it. Because we internalize, when we're learning about how to meet our needs in the world, uh, the single most important uh, influence on us is the adults you know, who mediate the world for us when we're so little and helpless, when us humans, we literally cannot survive by ourselves. We have to be helped to survive in those early years. And we have to learn from those caregivers how to go about meeting our own needs because we don't know how to. Uh, we have, the, as I said uh, earlier in, in the, this session, uh, we have the tools for doing it, but they have to be attached to the world, and they can be attached in different ways to the world. Um, so I am very mindful and agree very much with the, um, with the um, uh, assertion uh, implicit in this question. You know, surely you can't speak uh, only of one mind. You have to speak of minds in relation to each other, especially during, um, during development. I agree with that very much. However, the way that that's worded, um, it, I think, is taking up a, a challenge that I posed uh, a couple of weeks ago when I said that I've put forward uh, four uh, defining properties of the mental, four obligatory uh, uh, um, dimensions to the mental. And I said, maybe you disagree. Um, does anybody think that, that they can be reduced to less than four? Or does anybody think that they need to be added to, that there should be more than four? And here seems to be 
uh, one such suggestion. And a fifth um, a fundamental criterion of the mental is that the, it, 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 it has to... How, how was it worded here? Um, can we say that a defining property of the mind is that it must have other minds to be a mind? I, I don't agree that this is a defining property of the mind in the sense that I've said, um, that, that I've um, uh, claimed for the other four defining properties, the four that, I, that I've introduced you to. I think that implicit in the ones I've introduced you to, um, especially uh, in relation to intentionality, uh, that there's, we always intend toward objects, toward the external world, that, we ha that our mental processes necessarily involve representations of the outside world because our instinctual drives and needs um, uh, require it to be so. I think that includes the category that's referred to here, that we need caregivers, that we have to attach to caregivers. This is why we have an in attachment instinct um, and so on. All, all of these mechanisms... Um, um, cover already the, the fact that we have to relate to external objects, including parental objects, which is what one of those instincts is about, this attachment instinct. But I don't think that that elevates the, the mind or, or, the, or the object, uh, the one particular category of object that we need to um, intend towards. Um, I don't think it elevates it to a separate um, defining property of the mind. Let me put it semi-facetiously. You know, we also need milk, uh, or we need sustenance. We need food and drink. Um, so can you? See, you know, otherwise, we'll die. Then there'll be no mind. Uh, so should we say that another defining property of the mind is, you know, food and drink? No, <laughs> I don't think so. So um, although I'm not wanting to diminish for a moment the importance of other minds. Uh, for the maturational and developmental processes that this question has been all about. Um, I don't think that other minds are a defining feature of a mind. Theoretically, um, a mind could uh, be raised by robots um, as long as they knew how to feed um, properly. It would be a very dysfunctional and sad mind, uh, but it would be a mind nonetheless. So, thanks. Speak to you again next week. Bye-bye.